So ladies and gentlemen, Sophia Bagwell. London, take care of your wounded. Chatting in toilets and bus queues to anyone. Who couldn't stop talking even if you paid them. Even if you held them every night till dawn. Their voices like music, they couldn't turn off. If they stopped for a moment, they'd sink. They were deaf. Help them. London, give them what they seek. The awkward age girls who haven't quite realised and still think they're flat-chested kids. The old ladies wilting and peeling like heat adult tulips. The clean again rock stars with cracked chiseled cheekbones. The ballet shoe women with gobstopper pearls. Don't turn away. London, please preserve them. The sleepless researchers and feral PR girls. The starlets in track pants packed eating a sandwich. The boys dressed as preppies and rich girls like strippers. The hot smelling <coughs> posh boys who DJ on Thursdays. The short shortage twats in Dickensian and flat caps. Try not to laugh. <laughs> London, be nice to them sometimes. Even the gobshites. <laughs> Even the no ones. Street corner mystics and fanny pack travellers who stand to the salt cellars clogging street corners. Pray for the buskers with diamond guitars and checks dropping CVs behind Soho bars. Give them a break. London. Don't let them fall too far. The jewel skulls, the runners, the gumptuous, cancer, the spans of companies named after buzzwords. Fly posters, ticket towns, strippers, protesters, teenage boys, twisters, fanny pack travellers, dance with salt cellars clogging street corners. Pray for the buskers with diamond guitars and checks dropping cities behind the bars. Give them a break. London, don't let them fall too far. The jewel skulls, the runners, the gum chewers, cancer, the spams of companies named after buzzwords. Ticket touts, Jesus freaks, trainee baristas, teenage boy toys with shoulder song sweaters, fly posters, label hounds, cleaners, protesters, keeping eyes <coughs> on them as they pass through in London. Because we are one or more or all of these things, help us too. Thank you very much. It's been my great pleasure to be Carrie Ann's friend for seven years, and I've been following her on this journey from a wildly successful young management consultant from a proudly working class background to being script tonight. And it's been an amazing, amazing experience. But one of the things I love about Carrie Ann is that she's just so much fun, and there's just so much joy and happiness radiating off of it. She's just such a joy to be around. We've done a lot of bad dancing in our time as friends. <laughs> so this is based on my favourite revolutionary bumper stick quote, which is, I'm not coming to your revolution unless there's dancing. And it also refers to the time when Carrie Ann's wife and I were at university, and we were in queer sock together. And she was the girl on the motorbike, and I was a scowling goth in the corner. So yeah, this is about dancing and revolutions. I danced everywhere as a kid, when my ego weighed less than my it. I would skip, jump and hop to when folks wished I'd stop, but both of them bawled when I did. When puberty came with this onslaught of shame as dreary as Methodist hymns, about what I should say, like if I was gay, like what I should do with my limbs. But I said, I'm not growing unless there's dancing. I'm not going, no way. So I'm gonna get old, but still I'm not old. I just wanna go out and play, okay? I'm cool and I'm grown, I have things in my own, like long nights and a hug and romance. I just wanna be free, it's all adult to me. I'm not growing up if I can't dance. Gay rage for my teenage agenda. Me and my mates chatting race, class, and gender. We get in front of state done semantic debates if somebody said gay or to bend. I was only 18 and my dreams were unclean, but my dreams stayed pristine every night. We spent long left with hours in our ivory towers being deliciously right. But I said, I'm not marching unless there's dancing, I'm quite happy inside. If I get to shout charge and stop the menage, you betcha I'm going to pride. I hate to be murderous, chairperson, sir. Could we just jump around in our pants while well, I hate to insult you? Well, counterculture, I'm not watching it, I can't dance. Now I live with the working girl blues, and I pay money for shit I don't use, don't you? You can scrape off your tack and get the sweat off my back, but you can't take my shiny red shoes. And I'll go all this way till I drop down one day and I get one last chance to repent. And when I get to my feet, then I'll say to St. Pete in that frankly unlikely event, I'm not coming unless there's dancing. I think I'll chance it below. Yeah, I know you guessed this is one of the best, but there's nobody on it, I know. And I hear that you mean on the old tambourine, but if everyone has to behave, then I'm going to choose fires over heavenly choirs, because the devil does do a good rave. I'm not dying unless there's dancing. I'm not living if there's no beat. No trusting the air to hold you up there. No landing on stage on your feet. So yeah, life isn't easy, but disco's still cheesy. And hip-hop's a breeze and punk rock's still sleazy. I need one kind of dancing to please me, not blues, ballet, techno, or trance. No, it's that crazy.
crazy rock star that I learned as a child and saved for myself in advance. So I'm prancing around with my brain drowning sound and trusting my balance to chance. You know it's not done while my heart's still drumming, while the heat's in my feet and the rhythm is drumming, so give me the beat and you know I'll be coming. But I'm not coming, I promise. <laughs> It's fantastic. You find some footage. She's script tonight, and I'm Sophia Blackoff. I'm just going to finish with a short one that Carrie Ann put on her blog um, earlier this year. I originally wrote it last year. It's unpublished. Doesn't have a home yet. So I wrote it as a response to Ferguson, and then I decided to put it online in the aftermath of what happened in Paris earlier this year. And it's one of those moments where you're just looking at the world and thinking, Can I take any more? Is there anything that I can still absorb? Do I have the heart to do this? How do I respond? Um, so I come up with this. Sleepwalking through relentless gas lamp grey. Breathless voices clamouring of rage and nothing letting up. The papers graying five more years of this. The headline's savage. You realise anger is not hot, <coughs> but cold. And lasts. People are praying, hands clasped with their chests in dark streets. Sing for the ones they mourn, welcome them home. Watch the blue flames lick up with like unheard prayers as you prepare the supper, hearing your lover pottering in the bathroom. Your grief is smart. It will not burn the house down, not yet. A candle, a sneak cigarette can be a blazing church for you tonight. Nobody's gonna tell you it's all right. Into the star, send out your star, lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, just before we start the kind of a second round of mouthy folks, um, we're going to get uh, someone from New International's, Helen Wallace, who's going to just do a little chat about uh, New International's, who are doing this thing. While uh, Helen's coming up, um, it's worth bearing this in mind with dancing. You know the famous saying, you know, if I can't dance to it, then it ain't my revolution. Who was that, Emma, Emma Golding or something like that? Um, when uh, I was going out with someone trendy uh, when drum bass got invented. You, you ready, Helen? Okay. And... Um, so I ended up going to Metalheads, uh, it was called, called Jungle in those days. Anyway, no one liked that stuff really, outside of London, trendy London. And I ended up um, on a New Year's Eve in a rave, there was a techno rave in the, in the junction in Cambridge. And I hate techno. So I, I was in this corridor where this guy, very early drum and bass DJ was, jungle DJ called Andy. And it was just me making love to a left hand speaker for about an hour. And, and Andy DJ, and then uh, occasional youngsters collapsing on pills. That was the only thing happening in this corridor, right? Uh, I didn't care about anything except dancing. This uh, drum, drum bass drum. It was amazing when it came out. Anyway, after about an hour, he drops his track. Drops his track. Well, I don't know. And um, it has his killer, killer beats, killer beats, killer beats. Think I stops as I stop. Killer beats, killer beats, killer beats, and then. It keeps dying. I go jelly bane on this because I'm a sad old sort of punk rock hippie guy. I think this is amazing. It keeps going. <laughs> Eventually it just goes. <laughs> and dies. Eventually after about 20 minutes. My feet haven't touched ground for about 20 minutes, right? And um, I go over to Andy the DJ to find out who was that great track. And Andy's lying on the floor. And with his mate just pointing at me, both crying with laughter. I'm going, what? <laughs> And again, the whole system's a bust, man. We're, we're fixing the leads, and, and you're just flying! So, you know, it might be your revolution to dance but no one, it might actually be a technical fault. Um, <laughs> Helen Wallace is going to talk a little bit from you and Ashes. Please welcome to the stage, folks. <laughs> But has anyone here heard of New Internationalist? Yeah. Did you check the, the, the list? People coming in. Has anyone here heard of New Internationalist? Yeah. Okay, I always wanted to do that. Um, well, just in case there's anyone here who hasn't heard of us, we are an independent, not for profit, award winning media cooperative. Yes! And each one of those words I say with purpose. And for over 40 years now,
now. We have been, we, you internationalists, has been campaigning and challenging critical issues of global justice around the world since the early 70s. And at the heart of who we are and the heart of what we believe is our independence. And I was freaked out the other day, and I know many of you probably already know this statistic, but 70% of all the news, all the information, the TV, the film, everything that we get in the UK, 70% is owned by three billionaire men. They control 70% of the information that we get. So independent media is facing a lot of challenge, but it has a critical voice and a critical role to play, particularly now. And I'm really proud that New Internationalist is here today and helping to host this amazing event. So if any of you want to get more involved in New Internationalist, want to find out more about what we do, there's quite a lot of us sprinkled like lovely fairy drops around the room, so please come and talk to us. There is Kerry Ann's incredible book on sale, along with other amazing publications for five pounds. The price of a hamburger. Feed the baby, feed the soul. It's your call. Do both. Um, there's also our amazing magazines, and you can get three magazines for free. And then, if you don't want any more, you don't have to, but I think you probably will. So if you want to sign up or check out what we do, or even if you want to give us a donation to help with the money for organising this event, because we're completely run by our supporters, by our readers. We are independent and proud of it, but any support you can give us in any way would be greatly appreciated. But most importantly, have an amazing night. So thank you. That's <laughs> I remember people doing mic check, turning up in uh, St Paul's during Occupy London and going mic check, you know, and there's like a thousand people and they go mic check, and a thousand people go mic check! And they go, that's all I want to do, good night. And they just start walking <laughs> off. Those people were doing that. Okay, um, uh, carry on, um, uh, uh, yeah, Helen touched on something very important there. We, well, I think it's important. Uh, there is a box on that table and I'd like to, if people have a couple of, uh, you know, a bit of change, I'd like to be able to put some money back into some of the people who are helping us out tonight, if, if that's okay, if people have got a bit of change. Sorry the beers are four quid, I had no idea that that was going to happen. If I did, if, if I knew that, I would have had a little crate underneath the table and done a little bit of business. Anyway, so now here we are on the um, on the second big bit. So there's going to be a lot of speakers on this, on this uh, it's going to be fast and furious. Uh, there was uh, one speaker who was going to have in the first, two speakers going to have in the first half, but I thought you were all kind of so overexcited, I think you needed a bit of a calming down session. So there's actually going to be eight people up on the stage. All right, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, fast and furious and exciting and inspiring and sexy. Um, so talking of sexy, uh, well, no, that's really inappropriate, actually. Um, but carry on, come on back up, all right? <laughs> I mean, that is appropriate. Carry on. And um, I'd like to get two people at the same time, so... Uh, Eva Jasbitz as well, who I think can bring some fantastic <laughs> stories. So, Kerry Mendoza and Eva Jasbitz, please. Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, you can have that in the middle, though. Are you okay? Frosted. Um, now, uh, is, that, is that actually working? It is. Yeah. Actually, I've got no idea about that. Um, the first half was slightly slanted towards those people who were dealing with austerity by, you know, sort of alternative media or what you may call new media. So we had Mark, who uses his cab in an extraordinary way, as we all know. Max, who's doing an amazing job with Russia today. And Kerry Ann, who's doing what she's doing through Script and I Daily and also through this book. And of course, New Internationalists through their alternative media. This second half is more looking at um, innovative or grassroots or campaigning. Crap word, isn't it? But but um, people's led movements, or ideally, fingers crossed, mass civil disobedience. Um, so we're going to be looking at people who are more in, inside that world. So what I'd like to do is start really with, with you, Eva. Um, Eva, if you don't know, Eva's involved in everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really, really is. And uh, she's, uh, you know, Anita, my wife, is at the back there. She's Eva's our hero. Genuinely, is our hero. Um, I guess really the question is, 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 is where, where is everyone? Because I've been asking that question tonight, all right? Um, and, you know, what, what's, apart from where is everyone and what's keeping people from being out there, what would you be saying that we need to be looking towards to, to, to kind of generate a kind of movement that may end up as a party like Syriza, or may end up as the, the straw that broke the camel's back, you know? That maybe this radical housing network, maybe that's what that is. 
But, but where do we go next? How do we get that sort of people's-led movement, genuinely people's-led? Not like 50 people surrounded by cops and we all know each other. You know, where, how do we move on from here? Okay. Thank you very much, first, for inviting me. Um, where is everybody? Where is everybody? Well, um, a lot of people are really busy working. Yeah. Um, I, I work as a union organiser at the moment for Unite with hotel workers, um, and there are about 100,000 hotel workers in this city. Um, there's the you know, combination of some of the biggest hotel chains, some of the biggest corporations in the world own something like 136,000 rooms in this city, and the average uh, rate for a night in one of these rooms is 144 pounds. And when you consider that homelessness has gone up in this city since 2010 by about 79%, bedroom tax is evicting people, gentrification is evicting people, social cleansing is happening, and to see all these rooms, and, and I was doing some cleaning to, to get accustomed to the job uh, in, a, in a particular hotel, you know, one of the biggest chains uh, in the world. And, you know, it's really hard to be active when you're constantly having to, to work. Your body is not your own. You're being forced to, in the case of the housekeeping department, which is the, the biggest department of any hotel, you can have like 30 to 50 workers there. They're all mostly migrant workers. English isn't their first language. They don't have confidence. Uh, they are vulnerable. You know, they're a paycheck away from being homeless, even though they're cleaning, you know, 16 rooms a day in these luxury hotels. And yeah, I mean, your body is not your own, your time is not your own, um, you know, eight hours a day minimum you're working and then the other four you're on a bus, you know, or two buses just getting to and from work. And the kind of movement that I really want to see is one that includes those people or that we have to do something about that situation. Like today, the minimum wage was announced that it's going to go up 20 to 30 an hour. You know, and, and that's supposed to be big news. That's actually, you know, the biggest rise that, that people have had for years and years. You know, it's still not enough. The living wage is not enough. The living wage is 9.15 an hour, it's still not enough. And, you know, if you're not working and, and you're unemployed, well, you're under the cosh as well, you know. People are stuck between the sack and the sanction. These are the two kind of disciplining pillars that working class people have got in this country. And that breathing space between those pressures is getting tighter and tighter and smaller and smaller. And, you know, the fear is if you lose your job, and by the way, like most people in the hotels are on zero hour contracts or four hour contracts. Notice this semantic change, because Labour will say, oh, we're gonna get rid of zero hour contracts. And I try to make their two hour contracts, one, four, five, six. Yeah. That's still a zero hours contract for people. So let's be really aware of that when, you know, zero hours might get abolished you know, after the election, it does mean the end of precarity. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a bit, a bit of a nightmare. You're either doing supervised job search or work there, or fearing your next interview and poss possible sanction and homelessness and you know payday lenders, or you're working, or you're quite comfortable, <laughs> yeah. or you're not, or you're in debt and you're worried about all this stuff as well. So I guess the kind of work that I mean, I'm massively inspired by the housing movement. And I think one of the reasons that is so successful is because you're animating a physical need and a real need and you're doing it by taking space. Like, it is a class war, we're engaged in a class war and territory is being taken and it's being held by people in the housing that the developers, that the privatizers want to take. So you're already there and you, they have to then deal with you and your body in the way. When you're dealing with work, and, and try to organize in workplaces. People are being held to ransom. Their body's not their own. They, they can't really put it in the way, like you could walk out, and we'd love to see that, but you know, it's hard to hold and take the space um, and hold your own. So a lot of solidarity is needed, obviously with the housing movement, but also you know, minimum wage, uh, migrant workers, zero hours workers, people in this country who you know, are in this machine of the hotel industry, and this, and it's not just the hotel industry, it's many, but I think we need to be there for, for those people, and it will be direct action, it will be like brand damage to these. Do you, do you think to some degree, like the tipping point with Brits was that austerity was that much more violent, in that in some ways what people are doing right now is they're like hanging on to the cliff edge, and they're saying like, 
you know, I can't just walk out of my job because they're like they're hanging on for dear life to that little that they have. And when you have Greece where you get 11% of Greece's population hit material deprivation, that is, they've got no food, they've got no water, they've got no heat, they've got no home. 11%, that's an enormous number of people that are no longer in precarity, as you put it, they're in destitution. They're now outside of the system. Um, but of course you don't want to wish 11% of people into material deprivation. It's like you want people to go, before we get there, <laughs> 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 you know, I think we've got that in this country, actually. I, I, our comrade from Greece, our from Greece can, can talk about it more, but I think there are some historical differences between fascism, fighting and defeating domestic fascism uh, being one. Yeah. Um, I don't think they ignore also this sort of, um, sort of little physical climate as well, the way that people can spend more time together out on the streets in a different way than Greece. But I, I can't really speak to Greece very much. But one thing I wanted to make a point about, I'm, I'm part of a group called Fuel Poverty Action, and we've got some other activists here, and um, you know, I, I kind of want to draw um, attention to non-spectacular work, you know, non-spectacular activism. Um, this is something, it's something that really kind of came to me, or had been coming to me for a while, when um, I was part of the direct action that shut down an Israeli drone engine factory over the summer. This is nice, thanks. This is my point, you made my point for me. <laughs> Which is, this is a very obvious, uh, spectacular activism, nine people in a roof, oh, you know, two days on the roof, shut them down during, you know, one of the most violent, horrific consorts against the Palestinian people. But it was more than nine people in that group. It was like a few dozen people involved in planning and organizing and supporting that action. Um, you know, there's you know, there's you know three dozen or more more than that in London Palestine action and who are doing this non-spectacular work of you know keeping up you know communications, Twitter, reaching out to people, doing trainings, you know, building people up. So and with with the body action some of the work we're doing is trying to really link kind of climate activism, which has always been associated with shutting down power stations or you know taking to treetops or you know stopping motorways, with the kind of daily supportive solidarity work with people who um, you know can't pay their bills, are about to be cut off by bailiffs, are about to have prepayment meters imposed on them, whose children are you know, freezing, you've got respiratory problems, you know, if you're growing up in a cold home, you're five times less able to concentrate, um, you know, as a, as a student, you know, you know, one in five people are choosing between heating and eating, and, you know, movements need to have something to, to say and do with people in that situation. Um, and, what you know, we can blockade the big six, we can go out in the streets, and we can do all, like, you know, exciting, visible, cool stuff, with loads of really cool people, and people Poverty Action does that. But it's that daily work of answering the phone and, you know, supporting people and, and you know, advocating for them with British Gas or E.ON or whoever is pushing them into the corner. So, you know, we do need more people in FPA. Raise your hand, Ruth and Claire Woody. <laughs> We've got some energy bills of rights, like this is really important because when people call, we don't want to just say, well, you write a letter to the CEO and you try and like go to their charity fund and, you know, install a payment. No, we want to control energy in this country, all over the world, uh, and make sure that it's not going to destroy our environment or, you know, interfere with communities. We want energy that's sustainable, um, that's harmonious with, with our planet and that we control, it has to be under our control. So the Energy Bill of Rights speaks to that and advocates that and says, you know, you're not alone, we're in this together and we need to fight for total systemic change around our energy system and, and defeat this myth that, you know, we're going to fight climate change and we'll have to have some terrible energy austerity and like freeze in the cold. No. Yeah. Um, there's ways of reorganising everything so that, that we have everything. Like, it is possible to have everything for everyone. Yeah. You shouldn't yeah. I can think it's not. There's a, you know, there's a sort of recurring theme, which is, you know, how, how can people take part, you know, where, where is everybody, and also, 
very important point, which is, you know, a lot of people have, have said to us, look, like, like with Occupy, for example, I keep going back to that example, but people would turn up on the weekend with a bag of, an old lady turned up every day with a bag of sugar. And um, she turned out to be Boris Johnson's secretary, which is quite extraordinary. But there were, there were people who would turn up with a van at the weekend, uh, you know, here's a load of food, here's a load of water, whatever. But they were going, this is all we can do. I've got a job, I've got a mortgage, I've got kids, it's really hard. But everyone was touching on something that's really important, you know, if you, if you do get involved in these grassroots groups, Man, someone who can man the phone for a day, the, the press phone for a day, or someone who can do, you know, help do the website. Or it, there's so many jobs for every direct action, like, like the one on top of that arms manager, uh, manufacturing joint. You know, okay, we did one um, at Christmas for last. Sixty people were involved in that. That's just amazing. But uh, the frontline part of it, the people actually doing the DA, that was less. But there's people who were organising this or do. There's so many different needs. And there's so many different ways that people can feed into these groups. That, you know, it's not that kind of you have to be up top of the building and do a banner. For everyone who's up top about doing a banner, you know, there's, there's a dozen people. Someone making a sandwich. So there's someone making a sandwich, exactly. <laughs> um, which is great. Let's, let's build on that now by, by bringing up some uh, uh, Sarah from, from uh, well, Sarah, I know Sarah from UK Uncut, but also Sarah's part of Sisters Uncut. Are you at that? So, yeah, brilliant. Um, Sarah, I don't know your surname, but just know you're brilliant. So, uh, Sarah, who's brilliant. Background, but, but like I was saying, you know, I from, uh, from uh, UK Uncut, but also Sisters Uncut. But there's a blinding thing on BBC right. Three, right? Which is that what's, what's it called? Fighting the system. Fighting the system. And Sarah's one of the people who are on that, along with Dan, Danny Paffard as well, a kind of a climate activist. And uh, I, I'm not saying that because she's my mate, she's at the end of the table, but she's absolutely fucking brilliant in it. Because it's all about being visceral to me. If you had to read a fucking book and, and I, you know, bollocks, bollocks, bollocks. And Sarah came across as an incredibly great advocate, I, I believe, um, for someone who's like, this is just what human beings do. We are not the extremists here, all right? We are the normal people, and the people who are doing nothing, they're the fucking weirdos. And we need to sort of try and reinvent the is it? Um, Sarah's a cracking example of that. Um, why are you laughing? That's got to be true, right? Yeah. I didn't say that. Yeah. No, but you're a great example of it. You know? And I'm not saying, oh, you're so normal. What I'm saying is, you, you exude, like, this is just normal. You're humble, and I think that's really important. Um, I guess a, a question uh, would be, How's it happening out there in the front lines? I know you've got Russell Brand sleeping in, in Aylesbury. He's, right he's in Sweet's Way. So Russell Brand's sleeping there tonight. Right so there's that whole celebrity thing which is useful. But, but what is this going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? Is the Radical Housing um, Network, is this going to be the thing that's going to be the poll tax that, that kicks off everyone in this country, do you think? Well, how does it feel from, from your aspect? I definitely feel like housing is something that um, people are convalescing around and that is radicalising a lot of people that aren't usual activists. Um, I definitely, like for the first time, in, like I've been like involved in activism probably since about 18 and um, for the first time I'm getting people from way back when, when I used to, who I used to grow up with on the estates that I grew up with contacting me and saying, how do you, how do you become an activist? How do you, uh, like, I want to do something. I mean, I'm fed up now. How do you, how do you get involved in that? Are these meet, what, what, what are these meetings? How do they, how do they happen? How do I get involved? That has never happened in, like, what, years that I've been involved in activism. And it, like, seriously, made me want to cry. I've been, like, old mates of mine and, like, cousins from, like, years ago would eat, like, Message me on Facebook and going, oh, I noticed that you're kind of involved in shit. Like, how does one do this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> I'm all fucking hyperventilating. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and I do, I do think that housing is something particular because in, in London, it like, I, you know, I don't know so much about outside London, but in London, it is something that is it's a real pressure cooker for, you know, Everyone knows someone it, like who is massively affected by the housing crisis. Whether you're waiting around, even if you're a professional, waiting to be picked to be the person to live in that in that um, you know particular flat, or you know finding somewhere to live on a, on a queue of ten people looking around the same house, you know being mugged off by some landlord. Everyone 
everyone is affected by the housing crisis in London, and it's getting. And this is something that everyone's convalescing around. And like in terms of you know what it's going to take for more people to get involved, I think focus e fifteen is a really really important thing to learn from because you know. I, I, through, through the things that I've been involved in recently, I've got the opportunity to write an article for The Observer. And in it, I talked a little bit about like, what are the problems of organising union-wise in, in work. And like, everyone was talking about zero-hour contracts. People don't know their, their colleagues, they don't see each other, they get a text on their phone on a Monday morning saying, you ain't got no hours. And then they don't. They, who, who do they talk to? Who do they know? Who do, how do they? How do they know each other? Who hasn't got any hours that week or that the week after that? You know, a hundred years ago, that would have been a hundred dockers putting their hand up, yeah, saying, yeah. "Oh yeah, I want a day's work," and then most of them being turned away. And then they can see each other and they can organise. They can do something about that. There's a human organiser there. That, that's it's different now. But with housing and what what I think happened with Focus E15 is you had like. 28 young mothers who were all given eviction notices on the same day, who were in the same space, who were living together, who could see each other and could talk to each other and could, could spark a bit of hope. And like, I, don't, I don't agree with the thing that like, what it's going to take to radicalise people is more shit. I don't agree. Proximity. I don't agree. Like I don't like people can deal with a lot more shit than they're dealing with now before they do anything about it. Seriously, seriously, all over the world people were dealing with more shit than we're dealing with now, and they ain't doing shit about it. It's not what it like more shit is not what it takes to radicalise people. It takes hope. And it takes someone. Like, see, 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 see. achieve that and you need other people around you people in London for the most part are really atomized from each other they don't see each other they don't know their neighbors they don't know their colleagues they don't know this they don't know that people are atomized from each other and that is what that is what I think sparked up in focus 15 it's the same thing that sparked up 100 years ago between workers you know that is what sparked up is that camaraderie and like we're all in the same boat and we've got a bit of hope that we can have something different and that's what you need to like get people on board now. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much. That's all right. fantastic. Um, I want to build on that hope, Andy. I can't see you, Andy. Andy. Yeah. Can you let that gentleman through from behind? Mind your backs. So, um, Andy uh, is. Uh, a lot of you will know him already, but he's a very, very, very classy, mouthy geezer. Um, he's the mouthy part of Dis Disabled People Against Nuts. He's easily one of the most inspiring activists I've worked with um, in my life, actually. So, can you pass that uh, over to me? Um, that whole line, I mean, I'm watching you lot all night. That line that Sarah said, it's hope. It's hope that's going to radicalise people. That's the line that got all of you eyes, by the way. So, you all got to me. <laughs> and what's going to happen is Andy's going to build on this. We're like a cult, really. We can it <laughs> All right? Okay? You will not leave this room until you've had to change your name and you're going to have to ring your mum and say, Mum, my name is Anyway, so. Um, Andy, let's change, uh, let's, uh, change this into a question. No, let's build on what Sarah's saying. I mean, hope is what's going to radicalise people. I, I've been on those actions with you and, I, and I've seen, you know, there's a dozen or 20 people. You know, we, we shut down the, the outside Downing Street or whatever three or four weeks ago. You know, you did a Maximus, massive thing. The enormous amount of preparation that goes into it and all this stuff. But very, very little impact on, on, on media itself. Very few people, unless you're kind of following this stuff, unless you know the hashtag and stuff. How do you even know this happened? And how do we push that forward? And, you know, hope is a great thing. How, how do you spread hope? How do you empower people? And how, how do we kind of join these dots? Okay, simple one. Over to you, Andy. <laughs> Can I just say, when I grow up, I want to be ever. I want to get really old, I want to be German. Do you know what? I met a young fellow right about five years ago. I was at a meet, and I kind of didn't realise the kind of the conversation I was having at the time. But I met a young fellow, and everybody's a young fellow to me these days. But I met this young fellow, he's about 20, 20. And he said to me, he said, people have all moved until two things happen. He said, first, 
they have to see, say that the deal they thought they were part of doesn't exist. So that actually, when you're told to pay your taxes, to work hard, to send your kids to school, to obey the law, to pay your rent, to pay your debt, to build communities, and in return, people you pay your tax, and people build infrastructure, and civil society, institutions, and democracy, and all these things, when they recognize that actually that deal doesn't exist at all. It's only one side. And that's the first thing that has to happen. And the second thing is that people have to recognize that we work more. That actually they are worth more. That their effort, their existence, and what they do on a daily basis matters. Not just to them, but in their communities and in the, tra in, in the kind of society that we're trying to build. Yeah. Um, and I think the kind of, in the face of it, a lot of the time, I'm reminded a bit of what Chris Hedges said. He said that he was in Berlin in November 1989. And he was, Chris Hedges. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then he was in Berlin in 1989. And he was part of a meeting on the 4th of November, uh, where a lot of the big organizers had been really kind of working hard, uh, you know, challenging everything that was going on and, and, and creating resistance. We're having a meeting and they said, yeah, look, you know, we're 12 months away from really having an impact here. We're 12 months away from really having a risk to order. Stand up and take, you know, take our position. And this is what we're saying. And within three hours, the burning wall would come down. And they were the people who were doing the work, building on the ground, and really kind of generating that kind of energy. And they didn't see it coming. They couldn't see it coming because they were so busy creating the work and you know doing stuff and just lighting up the path. And I think kind of our our role isn't to kind of lead anything, but it's certainly to give an example and to say, look, whatever roles you choose, this is the kind of stuff that you can do. That actually it doesn't matter what you do, but you must do something. You must absolutely do something, whether it's write a letter to your local paper, whether it's go to your local politician and sit and give them drugs, whether it's standing outside your town hall, whether it's just informing yourself and understanding what you're about and what it is that actually you are, you know, your existence is part of and what your value is as a person. You must do something. You know, so I think the first part of that is almost complete. I think that people are seeing that actually the deal is only one side. And I think that actually, you know, that part of the narrative is speaking to, that actually there are people out there who are capital who are, who are coming to that conclusion because of their own experience and not very much about what we're doing. But when they discover that they're worth more, they look to what has been done. They look to the people who have been out there doing stuff to actually say that actually people are out there challenging them. People are out there discovering the work. People are out there actually creating kind of work, rather, you know, being proactive rather than reactive. And I think that's really important. Fantastic. Yeah. Can I just say that what you've described, and I want to say this um, in, in solidarity with people facing Islamophobia, you've described jihad. I don't know if there are any Muslims in the room, um, but there's a real sort of degradation and kind of mis misappropriation and misrepresentation of jihad, which means struggle, and the many different levels of struggle that exist, one of which is just informing yourself and you know, knowing the truth, and then by taking it kind of you know, levels and levels of further. But I just wanted to say that because it came to me, and I think we're living in like really hot or Islamophobic kind of times where there's a lot of mixture of racism and Islamophobia happening around Europe and, and in this country too, and like fucking intensely in the Middle East. Um, I just wanted to say that. I won't talk for too long, I know there's a lot, lot of people that need to get stuff said. It's just to, like, um, it brings to mind, there's a brilliant quote by an American um, a lesbian actress called Lily Tomlin. He says, you know, I was waiting for someone to do something, and then I realised I was someone. You know, I, I know, you know, those of those of you who are part of Occupy or are part of Pure Poverty or part of you know the housing movement, when you move from because this is a worldview, this is where you see yourself in the world, and you move from a world where you feel at the effect of circumstances, you feel like you don't you're just just another kind of sheep in the midst of all of this 
cattle and nothing you say or do will make any difference whatsoever. So you're just going to turn on standards, which I love by the way, but it's not exclusively all I do. <laughs> You know, just numb yourself until you go to work again tomorrow and get screwed over again. You move from that world, like um, Sam's friend, several your friends are, you know, and actually going, hang on, I am somebody. I matter. Like, I have the power to affect change in the world. Like, it's me. I'm the person that's going to make this movement happen. I'm the person that's going to stop my community being evicted from their homes. You can't imagine that transition that you go through as a human being when you have that. And that's what is so compelling for people to bring them off of the fence. You know, it's like, empower yourselves. You know, you're not selling them a struggle. You're selling them you know, ownership of their existence. You know, have a purpose. Leave the planet in a better state than you found it. Come alive, essentially. Um, and that's what we need to be, need to be offering people. I and mean, it's so exciting that people are starting to, to actually get that and go, I want a piece of this. You know, it's like, I'm not being lectured to and going, oh man, that's so boring, she's talking about politics again. It's like, I want to be there. I want to be there when the police come. And I want to be the person that is the last person standing when they're dragging us out of our houses. It's like, you know, that kind of environment. So, yeah, it's also, it is like <laughs> Is there some hope in the room? Yes! yes. How do we do that? Um, solidarity, joining the dots, hope, which I think is such a key line that came out also. What, what um, Andy is saying about you knowing your own value, but also again, that whole idea of you know people going, oh, you know, oh, it's brilliant what you do, but you know, I don't know how you can help. That sandwich is really important. And it, it made me think about um, the anti-fracking movement. I'm telling you now, there's all these people up and down the country I've read the Daily Mail all my life and I've been lied to. And, and I've never had so much good cake. I've never had so much good cake because they made the cake. If you go back to the 1990s, the road, the road movement, which was incredibly successful, Newbury, etc. There were these like, you know, Blue Ridge Brigade coming out and, you know, the trustees living in the tops of trees who were eating seriously good cake. And it's happening again. I'm, I'm, I'm being... I'm sort of being funny because I, I, I'm sort of keeping the, the, the mood light. But actually, it's incredibly important to know what we're talking about here. You know, when people get radicalised, you know, and it's hope that radicalises you, I'm, I'm sure it's the best line we're going to hear all night. Um, then people go, what can I do? And they realise there's, there's no one in this country who doesn't have something to offer the movement. That's just the bottom line. There's no doubt about it. And it's really important to break down those boundaries of exclusivity. Oh, they're activists. They, well, you know, I don't know, they're... Hackers and they climb buildings. And then, no, it's, this is what normal people do. We're not the extremists with normal people. Um, I want to bring on, uh, 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 okay, some more um, lucky people. Um, I want to keep mixing it, okay? So the, 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 the first part was the media part, but I left out someone because I thought, well, okay, people are giving the flag. Are they giving the flag now? I don't know. Really? You thought to yourself, then, my family. Um, um, yeah, so there was one person who's another blogger who I really wanted to bring up. So I'm going to bring up Mike Sivier now as well. Vox Populous, is that right? Vox, Vox, Vox Political. Vox Political. So please welcome to stage um, Mike Sivier. And. Mike, do you want to sit down? Uh, in fact, we all move down, Mike. We all move down, Mike. Is that right? Yeah. No, no, it's just as other people coming up. Um, I feel a bit weird coming on after everybody else because you've had all these fantastic people, UK and uh, single people against cuts. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm a writer, I come from London and Weld, in the middle of darkest mid Wells. Yes. Um, I started a blog about three years ago uh, because I had nothing else to do with my spare time apart from be a carer, as that happens for my, for Mrs. Mike, who is uh, <laughs> long term disabled. And uh, a lot of the things that I write about in the blog are because of things that have arisen with her. Obviously being disabled, being uh, sick for a long time, uh, she's had a lot of the sort of the brunt of the austerity cuts to do with disability. Um, and uh, I've had to sort of fight uh, against that and I've had to write about that as well. And uh, I've done a bit of campaigning, I suppose, uh, trying to find out how many people have sort of lower the food of the room, how many people have actually died because of these cuts and because of the, uh, the work capability assessment. 
uh, that is uh, used to to inflict them on. Uh, Can on you give us some of the stats, statistics that you've researched, if you don't mind? Please. Well, we, the, the, the only statistic that we really know is the 10,600 10, uh, between January and November 2011. And I've been trying to get the this Department for Work and Pension to, to say something else about that for the last couple of years, really, because uh, there were requests put in, in 2012 to find out what the update was, and they said, oh, we're not going to tell you. Because uh, presumably they had a bad reaction from the year before. So uh, they didn't want to have uh, a continuing bad reaction uh, all the way up to the election. So uh, I put in uh, this request. I, I appealed against it and uh, I took it to a tribunal and uh, I lost. What? So that was that. What yeah. were their reasons? What were their reasons? Uh, well, it, because I'd asked lots of other people to put the request as well. And they said, no, you can't ask lots of other people to do that. Uh, because that's vexatious, you see. You, you're asking us to do a lot more work. And uh, my response was, but when one person asked you to uh, give it out, you wouldn't give it out either. So what's the solution? And, uh, sorry, you can hear my Bristol accent coming out, can you? <laughs> Bristol originally, like Kerry Ann and... Uh, uh, perhaps that's why I'm brought on later, because you would be flooded with Bristolianism. <laughs> <laughs> So I lost that one, but I put in another, the, the tribunal said they were very sympathetic to me, and if it wasn't for the rules, they would uh, probably come out with a different response. So I put in another request. Uh, this is last year, and uh, technically the DWP finally refused it a couple of weeks ago. So uh, that's, uh, they're supposed to do it within three weeks, but that was about, I don't know, eight or nine months, I suppose, which is... Uh, Really good, but I'd already figured out that they were going to refuse it anyway, so I put in my appeal uh, with the Information Commissioner's office, and uh, they called me up last week and they said, uh, "Can we haggle a bit about what you will uh, accept and what you won't?" And I said, "Yeah, we can haggle a bit." So we haggled a bit, and I said, "I'll accept one thing and accept another thing," and that the rest was non-debatable. And the guy said, "Okay, well, I'm very nearly ready with my decision." So you never know your luck. We might have something before election time. That I could bring, uh, take away to uh, to the political people and say, look, here it is. We don't want any more of this. Um, I recently got into trouble with uh, the Labour Party because of it. Because I was, uh, uh, I, I put up an article saying uh, Labour is basically saying that it will carry on with the work capability assessment. So uh, what you're basically saying is, since people are dying as a result of it, either by uh, reason of their, their health problems being exacerbated by the stress of going through this, uh, this particular uh, medical, because it's a, a, there's a build-up to it, and then there's a, uh, the assessment itself, and then there's the waiting to find out what you, whether you've got it or not as well. So, uh, and I went to, uh, this is my assessment, so I know all about it. It's, it's really, really stressful uh, just being in the room with somebody who is doing it. So you can understand why people, uh, they call it part afterwards. Mrs. Mike was on the uh, sofa, uh, unable to move for three days afterwards. I mean, she couldn't move. So, you know, if she needed to, to you know, um, do a revolution or anything like that, I had to help her out, which is actually what I'm supposed to do for living anyway, but I'm fine. But that's the sort of thing that I, I don't know about what other people do who don't have people like me around. You know, it would be very easy to understand why they just fall into a cycle of depression and eventually, you know, if they don't get the benefit as well, they just decide to, to end it all, and uh, a lot of people have. So, um, I wrote the article saying that they were basically asking people to lay down their lives for the party, and that wasn't on, and uh, I got into terrible trouble with the uh, Shadow Secretary of State as well. Who had, who had actually basically said as much in, uh, in a meeting, in well, and uh, he didn't like having his words uh, spoken back to him, so he's, uh, I think he's threatening me with the law at the moment. But he's got, he hasn't got a leg to stand on, because I got the law as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am actually a journalist. I did study years and years ago, so I know I uh, very well, and I know when I'm not doing it. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's the situation with a bit of luck. I'm, I'm sending a letter into the Labour Party anyway. Uh, saying uh, basically, uh, here's the situation. Uh, it would be great to be able to send in the statistics with it because that would be uh, a great thing to back it up. But uh, if not, 
then will the Sierra go? So I can always add them in later. Anyway, that's well, the situation. How, how do people support you, Mark? What's, what's the name of your uh, Twitter feed or your website? Your blog? Well, the, oh, the blog is called Vox Political. I did actually put it out under my own name, Mike Sibia, but um, strangely enough, people, I don't know, perhaps they could spell it or something, I don't know. So Vox Box Political, yeah. Thanks. Uh, easy as that. Thank you. How do you feel about being accused of a Green Party blog uh, or share? That happens all the time, though, doesn't it? You know, if you if you say uh, if you stand up for one thing yeah, in an article, then anybody who's against it yeah. uh, will just turn around and say, "Oh, well, you're just uh, you're just a shill for that particular party." You know, obviously, obviously, you're you're, you're in their pay, you're in their employ, aren't you? Uh, you know, how much did they give you for this? Somebody actually asked me how much Vincent Crosby would pay me uh, to do stuff. So uh, you know, he's a conservative guy. Let's try and handle that. Like, Never met the man, and if I did, I would certainly give him the length of my time. So uh, yeah, you it, it just it's, a, it's part of the course. It's you almost a bad to say you're getting somewhere, aren't you? If you've been accused of being a shill for That's right. this so, or that, you know, or you know, for Putin's paying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take my list. We're running short on time, and I know we've got some brilliant um, performance that I want to end with. Um, can you just give Mike a round of applause? Three more, three more people. This joy is rare up here. Um, I've only got three more people to bring up. Um, so, uh, it's my, uh, it's my, it's too. There's Ace in here, because I haven't actually spoken to Ace. Has Ace turned up? From Aylesbury Estate? Ace? No? Okay. Um, well, one thing that's important, you know, I want to leave like 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes at the end. Grab these people. If you want to support them, yes, make sandwiches. Yes, do websites. Yes, take photographs. Yes, Sign this, sign that, but you know, grab these people and support them with the good things that they're doing. It's not hard. I'll also write a blog for the new internationalists on, the, on their website, so you know, I'll put the names and links and stuff. Carry this on. It's a good way to be, isn't it? You know, I'm taking out, we all fuck really well and we all dance really well. <laughs> it's just, it's a remarkable coincidence, but it's what I've found over the years. Um, One of the ones that I'm really close to is uh, Occupy Democracy. They, they've been going since October last year, where they occupy Parliament Square for, for eight days. And you know what? Well, there's no, ten days, ten days. Um, and there is a lot, you know, a lot to be said for you know, judge a movement by how ridiculously it's been policed. You know, how insanely, almost comedy level policing. So, so if, if that's how you judge a movement, then, then Occupy Democracy are all chains of horror, wrapped in with Emma Goldman, with everyone really. Um, because, you know, a, a young person was arrested for having an empty pizza box. And, so, you know, you guys have probably looked up already anyway. But I'd like to bring up to, to the stage uh, Aisha Dodwell from, from Occupy Democracy, if that's okay. <laughs> At the same time, and everyone wonder if he's not going to get off. Um, at the same time, Cam as well, Cam Sandu from, uh, she was the founder of, of uh, Workfare, and also <laughs> <laughs> No, she wasn't. A real fair. Great idea, Yes, Yeah, she was the founder of Workfare, and she was the founder of Workfare, and also of uh, Real Media. Now, I'm, I'm going to pass the mic down to you, you guys, um, and I'm going to leave the interviewing or, or the prompting to the brilliant table. That's a good mic. And... Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, we can all, we can all pick up. Yeah, okay. So, um, if we start, start with you, Aisha. If you, um, you know, you are, you know, that question of where is everyone, well, a lot of people are there, there once a month. Can you give the audience a, a kind of a glimpse of, of what what are the doctors actually up to? What would you consider as successes of them? All right. Um, first, of all, to say I'm really humbled to be up here with all these people who are like real activists and write books and articles and blogs. You're a real activist too. <laughs> <yes. laughs> I'm just an ordinary person that kind of rocked up at Parliament Square six months ago and was um, just really taken aback, like they say me at the 
police response to what we were trying to do and kind of stood there looking at these, you know, seven foot tall fences in front of Parliament and realised, shit, like, these guys, you know, Occupy Democracy really touched on something because if this is a response from the establishment, then I know we're onto something. Um, so, yeah, just to say that's, that's kind of what, what got me, I guess, sitting on this chair. But what Occupy Democracy is up to, I think, you know, what we've heard this evening is a little bit about, you know, cuts against disabled people. We've been talking a bit about housing action. We've been talking about fuel poverty, about the austerity agenda. We've been touching on a lot of issues that affect a lot of us. And, um, you know, I'm someone that's kind of been interested in politics my whole life and, you know, been on a number of marches and been concerned by a number of, yeah, those issues. But, you know, what... Occupy Democracy, I think, is you know what we're trying to do is say actually all of these issues together fundamentally come down to the same thing, and we're trying to join the dots. And it's quite yeah, it's, it's a bit of an idea that actually the the system that's kind of governing us is what underlies all of these single issues. So the fact that we have a you know so-called democratic system that essentially represents some, you know, commercial interest that really acts for profit rather than people is the reason why you have housing cuts. We have, I think it's a third or a quarter, but a good proportion of MPs are, are um, rent to, what's it, buy to let landlords. So, you know, of course we have a housing crisis where the people who make the rules and decisions about housing have conflicts, have really, you know, obvious conflicts of interest. You know, problems with you know austerity because the people who fund those, the people that fund you know our government are are not you know are not concerned about the people at the bottom of society, the poorest and the most vulnerable in society. You know, so we've got a system that, that's kind of broken, and that's what Occupy Democracy is trying to do is say actually all these single issues come down to the same fundamental problem that we don't have a system that represents the many. We have a system that represents the few, which you know, the Occupy, the broader Occupy movement has coined those terms. You know, the 99% and the 1%. Mm -hmm. We think we have a system that represents that 1%. So what we're trying to do in you know an different movement in terms of Occupy Democracy, which obviously comes out of the hard work of people like you, Jamie, with Occupy London. But we're trying to say, well, let's kind of get active and let's try and you know address this head on. And so since October, we've been going to Parliament Square, attempting to occupy that space, which is a really symbolic space, once a month. And we've been in that since sort of October, we're back in November, December, January, February, March. And now we're building up towards, what we're trying to do is build towards a big 10-day occupation, May the 1st to 10th, which covers, crucially, the election period, which, you know, it's not the be-all and end-all, it's one election, it will come and go, we don't think it will make much difference, because we don't think democracy I mean, I, don't, I think most people involved in Occupy Democracy don't think that election represents what democracy means, but it is, you know, in terms of our nation, it is a time when people are highly politically astute and alert and talking about things, and so it is, you know, it's symbolically an important time. You know, it's quite an important election in that we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, it could be a hung parliament, so we're going to try and occupy that symbolic space for 10 days over May, um, and we're going to try and, you know, do direct actions that really highlight problems of, you know, MPs having conflict, conflicts of interest, problems of how our politicians are funded, you know, so on and so forth. So that's that's kind of what we're up to, and yeah, I'd encourage everyone to get involved. And I think it's really important that you know, it's, uh, you know, no doubt, all these single issues are extremely important, and we should tackle them. You know, it's all baby steps. You know, of course, we should tackle them as we can. But it's really important at the same time to recognise the big picture and to also tackle the systemic problems um, that, yeah, that, that underpin it all. And I think Cam's going to talk about the media, and I think that comes down to it as well. I mean, the role the media has in who runs our country is ridiculous. And I realise that at a really young age, you know, without any kind of, you know, yeah, any, any analysis, and she's like, oh right, yeah, the sun is supporting that party, and they got in. Oh right, yeah, mm -hmm. that's how that's how our politics is run. Um, so what we need to do is join all those dots and come together, and you know, and say, yeah, 
let's let's tackle that system that allows all this to happen, you know? And that that's what we're trying to do with Occupy Democracy. So yeah, join us. Lovely. Thank you. Right, don't have training at all, because that's exactly the way to intro what Cam's gonna talk about. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Cam, I'm from Real Media. We've got um, Anthony Mel Week happening this week ahead of Occupy Week from Murdoch next week. Um, and in April we're launching an independent news aggregator which is going to be news away from corporate interests, away from advertiser interests because that's what we need to not dock to the information that we get. Because information is a fundamental step, it is the key to teaching ourselves, to liberating ourselves, to hearing voices from people that are in a situation like this, putting people back into the narrative. Um, you said, Jamie, you know, why aren't people, where is everyone? Yeah. I think like, when I boil it down to it, what we've had for 30 years is this self-interest politics that has completely atomized us. So we've had people thinking that they aren't getting by because it's, some, it's their own moral failure, or it's because they haven't competed hard enough, or they haven't worked hard enough, but they're in a system of social engineering that was built for them to fail. And we need to, what we need to realize, I mean, um, one of my friends, Erica, she said that, why isn't there a stampede of young people in this youth unemployment? And she said, because they're all going through this job hunt separately. They're all competing with each other. And there, they're all by themselves. And we need to see that we're all going through the same thing. And we can all find the, the um, solutions in that together. Um, yeah, so what it boils down to is the fact that, yeah, um, one of the quotes, Danny Dorling said that um, when inequality increases, um, people become more right-wing, so people become more about themselves, um, but what they need to realise is that, um, you know, our, our solution lies in helping each other more than anything. As you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Media Lens, and one of the quotes at the end of their books uh, said by a psychologist is that looking after number one is more characteristic of sadness than of well-being. And when we look about society and we see the way we perpetuate this fear and being by ourselves, that's not the way forward. Working together, you know, organisations like we're doing with us, with, with Real Media, combi combining with those uh, individual organisations, what Script Night's doing, what, um, you know, releasing this book, this is empowering material that we just need to get out there. Uh, for example, uh, one of the organisations that I really love is Old Gen. Sorry if I'm talking really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are like um, working with young people to start their own cooperatives, uh, and that's about uh, finding a solution out of youth unemployment and finding you know a different way out of an economy that's shitting on young people every day. Uh, and at the heart of it is saying that we should have social justice within our workplace. Like, that's empowering, that's something that we should have. And that's the difference between a neoliberal system that's trying to keep you empty all the time, trying to fulfill that need, and a system that we can build where we're trying to fulfill our values that we should be fulfilling every day. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> anti daily <-dating> Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> and what's happening in the week after? Um, taking the issues to Murdoch, trying to call him to account for all the crimes that have been committed. This is a guy who's walking about his daily life, spewing messages into our head. We should have been jailed a long, 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 long time ago. So, yeah. so there'll be a trial, I think, Monday morning. Um, Rupert Murdoch's been put on trial by Oxford, outside the charge. So, yeah, I think that's 10 a.m. Monday, right? Yeah. Right. And tomorrow there's uh, Block Pie at 2 p.m. Yeah. at um, St. Paul's. And that's taken it to the banks, these fucking financial <laughs> bastards that have been getting away with it too long. <laughs> 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 need to have some uh, lightness of music, so I just want to uh, one more time get you folks to show your appreciation for Cam and for Aisha and for Mike and for Sarah and for Eva and for Kerry Ann and Deja. <laughs> As I've said, what I'll do is um, try and put a vlog together, that hopefully it'll come out tomorrow or the day after, but what I'll do is I'll list all the people who are here talking, all the things that are happening, all the dates they've been talking about and stuff. It's been brilliant having all you folks here. Um, there's a little, there's a little, uh, we want, I wanted to pay for some of the travel of the people who came here. So there's a little box on there. But there's some books that you get signed by Kiri and Mandela. And um, I think we're going to stretch a little bit later than uh, uh, 10, 10 uh, 30 because I want, uh, we want to hear some beautiful pieces.
from the amazing Peter Temple, who's going to be over there in five minutes' time. Is that all right, five minutes for you to set up? So charge your glasses, smoke your smokes, and get ready uh, to have Peter Temp bring some. Um, uh, if, it's, if, it, if I can dance to it, it's my revolution. So let's, let's see if we want that revolution. <laughs>